The Waco History Podcast is sponsored by Brotherwell Brewing on Historic Bridge Street in Waco. Cross the Brazos in Waco Ride hard and I'll make it by dawn Cross the Brazos in Waco I'm safe when I reach San Antonio Welcome back to the Waco History Podcast. Uh, I'm excited to have a uh, living legend, which is always a Scary thing to use on a, on a local because it it sounds a little bit too much like a eulogy, <laughs> and we're not here to eulogize a man who is uh, working and active and fighting, continuing to fight the good fight. Dr. Jimmy Doral, uh, former executive director of Mission Waco, lead pastor uh, at Church Around the Bridge, and and all sort of lecturer at Baylor and all sorts of uh, titles he's held during uh, his long tenure in, in Waco. Uh, but I asked Jimmy in, if I may, please, Jimmy, may I call you Jimmy? Please, <laughs> please. Uh, I've asked Jimmy in to, to talk about, I mean, one of the things that, that Jimmy teaches on and, and has a deep understanding of, of as we look at uh, the history of the community we live in is, you know, kind of the other side of the tracks, the, the, the uh, poorer aspects of our community and Poverty has always been with us, and it's always been a part of Waco's history. But it's uh, it's sometimes it's some it's a little more difficult to see historically uh, the ways in which it's operated in our community. And so Jimmy has a, a great angle on that, and through his work principally with Mission Waco. And so I'd love to just start with that story, Jimmy. And I know you've only told it a million times, but you're telling it here first uh, for us. So if you would just give you, you, and, you and Janet that, that story of, uh, of starting that out. Well, thank you, and it's a privilege to be here, and thank you for willing to, to talk about an issue that we nobody likes, who wants to talk about poverty and marginalization, but it's the world we live in. Um, I um, was your classic kid growing up in a Christian home with all the bells and whistles of church, but we're very divided society, came to Baylor in 68, and I became a youth director um, when I was, uh, I guess I was just 19 or 20. And uh, so I got off the campus into the community of Waco and went to the eat at Waco High or um, University of Richfield, different schools, and got to know the kids. But Waco was emerging. I grew up in a very racist background town, blacks, whites, Hispanics separated, no little leagues were separate. Conroe had a, a separate um, um, venue for everything that was divided and then we came to Waco and it wasn't quite that uh, challenging but they were beginning to integrate and it was still a a big problem in figuring out what to do Um, but what I discovered soon after being here was that uh, even though um, poverty was worse most cities have a poverty rate of 13.3 percent Waco's is 28.7 and uh, those numbers didn't mean a lot early on, but I came to realize that we were, in fact, at one point, I think, ranked number 19 in the nation in terms of per capita poverty and all the issues around it, teen pregnancy, uh, dropouts, um, all kinds of uh, issues that incarceration, people that were living in the squalor of all of it without ho- hope and didn't know where to go. So there was a lot of issues around Waco that, uh, that nobody wanted to admit, but they were mostly in the lower income neighborhoods, mostly people of color because that's, they had no opportunities. And so what happened uh, was one day I had a phone call from uh, Dewey Pinckney. Uh, Pinckney was an African-American pastor, also head of the NAACP, and his church was in a part of Waco called, well, really in Waco, it was right between Waco and Bell Mead, uh, called St. Mary's Baptist Church. Now, I was a, a white kid, didn't know you could have a St. Mary's Baptist Church, and so I went over to No Man's Land, this mm-hmm. name of this pocket of poverty, and um, he said, would you bring your youth group over to this part of the community and help us with a vacation Bible school for these kids? Well, again, I was coming out of this very narrow view of the world when I, when I did that, but we took the kids over, and it began to change my life. Uh, we walked around, I remember knocking on a door, that was a house that literally was falling down. It had a tree growing through the front porch. Uh, we, I asked Pinckney, I said, can I go in and look? And he said, yeah, nobody lives there. And pushed the door open, and as soon as I did, rats and ra- roaches ran everywhere. The smell was overwhelming, and a man screamed who did live there. 
uh, completely blind, didn't see us because he was living in that house without any kind of utilities, any kind of water. And I couldn't believe, how could that be in any city in America, that kind of poverty could exist. And I was just two miles from Baylor, and it was like two worlds that I didn't know existed. So uh, we said yes, we wanted to go over and played with the kids. And what we've discovered through the years, it's relationships. You know, mm -hmm. it, I can give you all the talks and the reasons why we should be doing this uh, ethically, but um, the reality was you just fall in love with those kids and realize that they have so few opportunities. So we stayed with those kids through the next five years. I youth directed six years. And, um, and, but, and Jimmy, that area, you took me on the tour over there. It's over uh, now. It'd be the east of I-35, kind of on between McLean Stadium yeah. and Bell Mead. Almost behind same. Sam's yeah. Club, yeah. right there behind there. It's still in a floodplain, and it won't be too many more years. Somebody will buy that and fill up the land but it was um it's it's got a few homes left over but a lot of it's the, the houses mostly fell down mm -hmm. but uh that was not so many years ago to me because it was so special and i you know i hung out pinkney was you know was a classic activist he mm -hmm. uh, i didn't understand activism because uh in my white christian world we didn't have those issues we didn't feel the oppression feel the prejudice and uh and so he would voice before the city councils and other things so i also learned that part of what it meant to be a christian is, is not just talking about stuff but doing stuff and pinckney was a good model for me as well mm -hmm. yeah i i want to come back around to that i just of uh, that kind of your view then of not really knowing the poor not really seeing uh oppression and i mean that that's going to be an ongoing theme with yeah. people that you work with yeah yeah so yeah. Uh, and now, so you, you also did work at Waco State Home. You were connected yeah. to Waco State Home? that yeah. was a real life change for me. I, after youth directing, uh, there was a pastoral change, and I was invited to come out with the new administration to the Waco State Home. It was a Texas Youth Council facility that um, was for kids that were dependent and neglected, ages 6 to 17. And this was sort of the bottom of the bottom um, where they it wasn't like the Methodist home where they had a little more money and a little few better facilities. These were cottages. Over th old, it was an old orphanage way back. And um, the they asked me to become the recreation supervisor out there. And I didn't know what I was saying yes to, but I was ready for a change. <laughs> it, was a, it was a change. I remember the first day going out there and uh, couldn't find the gym where my office was and saw a house parent talking to a small child named Moki and uh, went over to interrupt them to ask where the gym was. And the six-year-old kid cursed me out. I mean, just filthy words out of this child's mouth. I ain't even done anything. He just, I thought, oh, my word, what is happening out here? And uh, I went on to the gym and opened up the doors. And about 30 minutes into the basketball game that the kids were playing, they got into a fight. And it wasn't just a ordinary fist fight. They picked up chairs and were hitting each other across the head. And it was the worst day of the worst week of my life. I didn't know what in the world I was doing out there and uh, felt so helpless. No training I had had helped me with any of that. But uh, And I had a little talk with God on Friday night. I had to remind him of how important I thought I was and had a Sunday school pen and had a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of accolades that uh, you get in high school. But um, uh, I, was, I was ready to quit, and it was kind of one of those – walks with God in the night where he speaks and you know reminds me you talk these big Bible verses it's time to put up or shut up mm -hmm. and it was a very important night for me and I remember going back the next Monday the kids were still cursed still got into fights but um, I had a new attitude that I was going to love them no matter what they did and uh, again nothing I had taken in classes or anything else really taught you how do you love a kid who's so broken parents abused them, um, some of them sexually exploited, all these horrible things that happened to so many of these kids who mostly wouldn't go home. Some did, but many didn't. And um, and so the good news is I had the keys to the gym, I had the keys to the swimming pool, I had uh, the toys they wanted to play with. And um, and so uh, through the next three years, uh, I, um, I loved those kids past their uh, their attitudes and became friends with lots of them. I still keep up with some of them, in fact. But it was a life changer for me. Had I not learned how to love broken kids then, I don't think I could do the work I do today. So it was mm -hmm. more than seminary, more than any kind of uh, education. Uh, it was just getting in the middle of it. And, uh, and the good news is I, my wife was a volunteer out there, 
and uh, she we they'd given us four Shetland ponies that I, I don't even ride the ones around Walmart that goes in a circle for a quarter but <laughs> she was a horse person and so she came out and and we met and through the years uh, you know the meeting on common grounds caring for broken kids uh, and went on to seminary from there so those were the, the really life-changing times for me the uh, I guess the visual of it happened at no man's land but the reality of uh, how do you really dig in there in relationships mm-hmm. and you stayed in Waco I mean you know I think folks may be surprised that you're not a Waco one some folks yeah. may assume you're a Waco one. well I did yeah. I, I went to seminary in Fort Worth and yeah. I would go um work all week I mean go to school all week I'm sorry and then I'd come back on weekends and work 20 hours uh, in, uh, at the state home for another year and uh, she was still in Waco and then eventually we finished up in Fort Worth and then came back to Waco for her to finish Baylor and then I did go to Houston um, there was a the renewal of the church is a big deal to me how do we mm-hmm. uh, do this stuff right because uh, the church is struggling and we, we I went to work with a guy that was one of my heroes named Ralph Neighbor down in Houston and uh, stayed three years, but it was on a, the west side of Houston, which loved the kids that I worked with and the people I worked with, but uh, we knew we'd been called to the poor by then, so we sold our house and took off, and for the next, uh, I guess it was four and a half months, we traveled the world and went to work some of the toughest places and got to meet Mother Teresa, got to work in the slums with the leper slums there with the Sisters of Charity and just different experiences as we went around the world and came home uh, to Waco because we didn't know where else to go and uh, decided that we couldn't go back to middle class America. It just, mm-hmm. it wasn't, we weren't judging anybody. It's just that when you've seen kids dying, when mama's holding them and you've seen the poverty of the world, uh, you, you just can't ignore it. So we decided to incarnate and be in the middle of the problem. So mm-hmm. we moved over on North 15th uh, about 45 years ago. Mm-hmm. So now we're getting to some history here. So to tell me that area, just, just the, give me a historical overview. This is 78. Right. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Yep. G- could you give me an, just what that area was yeah. like? So some of this was what I learned. Some of it was still going on. Um, Waco had been pretty much divided as well by uh, color and by poverty. And uh, most of the poor were African-American living on the east side of the river. Mm-hmm. The north side where we live was mostly older homes of white people, 1,500 square foot homes. So it wasn't a affluent area but it was middle class America and uh, then on over to the 15th street there were some larger homes but it was the bigger population and in the 60s as King was marching and the world was changing and so many questions about legal things and uh, finally the African Americans realized they didn't have to live in East Waco and these old houses were now affordable for some of them and as they began to move across the river into North Waco then um, the middle class began to run and it was kind of we, we call white flight they went to uh, the different suburbs we went to woodway and robinson and china springs and just to get away from this this uh, the unknown basically and uh and so that neighborhood had completely flipped mm. um th- while i was here i mean we used to yeah, go really to, quickly right? yeah because yeah. we we did the restaurants over there were good good restaurants the, the jubilee shopping center that we um, have now was uh, you go to the, the old Texas theater you had uh, uh, a couple of restaurants there that were really good and then we had um, uh, there was a beauty shop or two so North Waco was a it was still was hanging on mm-hmm. but as the demographics changed pretty quickly uh, then they all left as well churches left as well so there really was just uh, a whole new beginning of a new population that was mostly bringing in the poverty. And so before long, it was, we had uh, crack dealers and prostitutes and people that were um, you know, in crime. And so the North 15th area, Colcord and North 15th, sort of became the, the bottom. The old theater had become a porno theater called the Capri. Across the street was Martha Jane's liquor store. And uh, there just wasn't a lot of healthy stuff going on over there. We bought our house about six blocks down the street, an old two-story house that uh, filled with rats and roaches and across the street from a bar, and uh, bought a 
4,000 square foot house for $12,000. <laughs> we remind people location, location, location goes both ways. And so you, know, you could do well on that <laughs> yeah, house if you wanted to flip it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. We can. Uh, and so we, we bought it and uh, it was a mess. It had a lady upstairs, uh, had just trashed everything else, two mentally Ill, Ill guys downstairs. And then this one lady, we call the cat lady, had 40 cats in the, the apartment downstairs. And <laughs> so when we bought the house, had to give, and it took three years to get the smell out of the house. But, but um, and we were so excited. And my father-in-law was not as excited as we were <laughs> before, man. But we really uh, <laughs> soon just moved in. Now, it, it was like you would imagine. Uh, we were the only white folks in the neighborhood. People wondered why we were there, where we narcs or we had some other issue or what the deal was and so we just started working on our house i had a full-time job as a grant writer and, and program director at an agency and we had young children so uh, most of what we started doing with the neighborhood happened after work or for janet during the day but relationships is what it's about and mm. so that was our total and we weren't down there to fix anybody we weren't down there to mm. to start a program we just started uh, hanging out with these folks and uh, got to know him. We built a basketball court, uh, about a, a small quarter of a court. That's all I had the extra money for. And then uh, got a little more money down the road, made it into a half court and eventually a full court, put up walls. The, the kids in the neighborhood call it uh, the cage because it's got a high chain link fence that uh, I don't particularly like the name, but, <laughs> but that was to keep the kids from chasing it across the street and get hit by a car. So th- for literally for 40 years of our life, the basketball court was the center of our world. And Mission Waco grew up basically on the basketball court the yeah. children would come we'd have they'd say can we just do a club and janet was incredible with them and so we do a children's club we call them king's clubs and then the teenagers said well why can't we do that so we started teen club and then janet got to know the women the mamas and they started a women's group and she began to map out uh who lived where and what their names were and and so it just became a, a relationship kind of deal and we found out real quickly that people uh, even in lack of trust, they could tell if we were there because we cared or if we if they were we were there because it was a project for us. And th- we did. And we, we care, didn't care. We weren't there to, to make anything happen. And so the good news is over time, those relationships went deep and uh, the women would tell Janet, can you help my husband get a job? He wants yeah. to work. Can't find a job. My uncle's on crack. Can you uh, find a place to get him in rehab? Because there was no places for men that were poor. And everything we did was bottom up. We just listened mm-hmm. to the neighborhood. And in time, when we found these friends in uh, CCDA, the national group, uh, it was the same model. It was like incarnation, or incarnational ministry, live among them, began to empower them, began to help them understand that they had to be a part of the change process uh, if we were going to help. And, uh, and then we listened, and they'd say, you know, we need this, we need that. And, and so we would work. I'll never forget the, the empowerment part. The, the poor get pretty discouraged. They, they'd seen the, the broke, broken systems, mm-hmm. bus, lack of living wages. They didn't, the bus routes didn't work for them to get to jobs, uh, all kind of issues. So when there was a pothole in the street and you know, they made the phone call to get it fixed, nobody came. And they had gotten discouraged over the years that the lack of response meant nobody really cared. And um, so as we began to talk about them, they had a, some of them had a real negative attitude that the city didn't care. And um, I remember um, we, Janet said, did you know that you can have a street light on your corner for security purposes? Everybody in Waco could have a street light. And there were just a few of them around. And or if they were there, they'd been shot out. And so uh, I remember um, we went down to the city and found out that they had to fill out a, a little survey and roster. And so we got that. She got it and began to go door to door and say, would you like to have a street light for security? And I, yeah, sure, but they won't, they won't come through. No, nobody believed it happened. And over time, got the signatures, turned them in. They took the, she took the ladies with them downtown and turned them in in the office. And uh, while they were there, uh, they said it would be about three or four weeks before you'll hear from us. Well, three weeks became six, became eight. And as they would say, see, we told you, you know, nothing ever happens. But you don't know my wife, and uh, she would uh, so we know we're, we're going to find this out. So she grabbed some of the women, and they went back downtown to the office where they left the the surveys, and said, uh, "You said that you would be here and do something about this and get a light." 
And they said, yeah, but we've really been busy and, you know, we'll, we'll get to it. She said, well, we're not leaving until you uh, find that permit and we're going to stay right here. So they didn't lo leave the room, the office. They found it. And uh, sure enough, in about three or four weeks, uh, there was some noise and they were digging a hole. And uh, people kind of wondered, really, is this going to happen? And then uh, the next few uh, days, an electrician showed up. They hooked up the light and found out on this particular day they were going to turn the light on. So we went door to door and invited people to bring cakes and refreshments, put up a table below the light, and they, we waited till dark, and the light came on, and you talk about excitement. That's empowerment. I mean, it, that they felt like they could make changes. And the whole model of uh, community development, Christian community development, is that. It's how do you help people recognize appropriate ways together to collectively stand for what is right and go to the right people over time and and they did that and so so much of what's happened through the years has been with the neighborhood people being the lead of that well i, I want to stop right there because i i've done interviews with folks that grew up in poorer parts of town and they do talk about darkness about the areas that were dark and the areas that were light and so 90% of the people listening to this haven't thought about it, the presence of a street light or not having a street light. But that's a, that, is a, that is really a big, yeah. a big deal yeah. um, in, in all sorts of aspects yeah. of that community. Yeah. So that's big. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it's whatever. There's, there's so many issues, and, and we, it wasn't too many weeks later we made a big sign. And of course, the drugs were all over the neighborhood, and we uh, had a big march from we, with a big sign, and we marched the whole way around two or three of the Section 8 housing complexes and singing and enjoying it. Like, it was just a sense that there was, they were there, they just didn't know how to organize in such a way to make a statement. Mm -hmm. And there's some great work out there by Robert Linthicum and Robert Lupton and different people who have seen this kind of stuff in a much more massive scale than us uh, in a big city and how do you deal with public school systems, et cetera. And, and it's not unlike maybe protesting, legal protesting, but it is more in the sense that the people are not just whining and uh, shouting. They're doing things that make a difference. So empowerment is the word that we really like. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you talked about, you know, you've done this long enough that you can generation, generationally see the effects of some people that. That's the best part. Uh, those kids that played on my basketball courts, uh, court the, and the mamas that came, uh, over time, we've been in the neighborhood 45 years now, and those children are now adults working. Uh, and uh, had, had a kid just last week uh, come by the house, and doorbell rang, and I went down, and an uh, African American kid stand there, just a big old smile, and he said, "Remember me?" And I said, uh, "Are you Ray Wright?" He said, "Yeah, that's me." I, I said, well, "Where you been?" He said, "Well, I got in a little trouble, but I'm I'm doing okay." But he said, "He said I just want to come by and give you a hug. You were my white daddy, and uh, you know it was that sense of we bonded uh, those children and my wife and I and, and our kids with them. Uh, it was relationships that went deep and still come deep. We we keep up with a lot of those kids, and some of them have done really well. Some haven't done as well as others, but it it is that sense that we want we want change, we want transformation, but it takes a long time. Yeah. And People like us, because we're a mobile society, people don't stay in the same neighborhood very long. But we did, and I'm not sure we even knew how important that was. But we have a saying this, like, you know, if something doesn't happen, you know, don't worry, we're, we're not going anywhere. We'll, we'll come back and, and see. So we had to push through buying buildings that nobody would sell us till years later. And when they gave us the, I say gave it, uh, down the street when we got the, the old building that had been boarded up, the old porno theater building, um, we, we didn't have any money and didn't have but a few volunteers and I went down and found the owner and said that this was four years later after it had been boarded up and we said would you consider making us a deal and he said no here and he signed the deed and handed it to me and all of a sudden we had five buildings sitting in water boarded up by the city that all had to be reopened with you know code inspectors uh, and we have this real the saying that's uh, we, there's a real fine line between faith and stupid. <laughs> and you're, you're never quite sure which side of the line you're on. <laughs> and I thought, man, what have we done? And uh, but we slowly we do one at a time, and we get neighborhood people that we'd all get in there and we'd clean and fix, and and uh, the inspectors would give us some grace and say, well, you got to do this, and we get enough money to put some something else in there. And it took a while, but one building at a time, all five buildings were restored, even the, the old porno, porno theater, which today, of course, is the Jubilee uh, Theater. 
uh, and the cafe and all those things that are down there. But it was just a um, little at a time. And so looking back, it's, it, it's amazing for us because we didn't know what we were doing. We just mm. did the next thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and the and the you know the the effect around that yeah. area yeah. is remarkable. Now tours go down through that area. Yeah. In fact, we we <laughs> <laughs> we left. Yeah. The, one of the Magnolia tours stops three or four times a day and tells the story of Mission Waco on the corner, and they'll call me and I'll go get in the van and and uh, mess with them. And they, you know they're from Washington uh, State and from Miami on the same van and think, how did this happen? Nobody would even come <laughs> to my neighborhood, and now they're coming to do tours over there. <laughs> but the, you're right. It was the synergy and and uh, you know not only the programs that help the children the teens and the the mamas and all that stuff but then we had to learn how to do economic development mm-hmm. they don't teach you that in the seminary we didn't know what we were doing but you, you got to have uh, re- instead of bars and leftover uh, junk shops uh, we had to f- get control of those buildings and then remodel them and today if you come over where the liquor store was it's an incredible ice cream place that uh, people mm-hmm. pack out and and uh, the whole other two buildings. So it's like the the early days of seeing the, it, it seems so impossible, but we didn't quit. We just did the next thing. And so it is, it's, it's just time. And yeah. by the grace of God and a lot of time, uh, we've, we've been able to see a neighborhood change. And we're still, you know, we're still hoping for a bank someday over in my yeah. neighborhood and still, yeah. still some gaps. But there's now people feel safe and our World Cup Cafe is, packed out all the time and our uh, theaters got theater going on all the time mm-hmm. for people and um, tell you a quick story this is kind of a fun uh, dream story we had a neighborhood kid named Stevie Walker Webb who was the neighborhood child that I guess he came as a uh, in a children's program we had real talented real fun and um, in poverty but uh, stayed with us and then he got into the teen program, and by then the theater was almost uh, gutted and redone. So we'd have some volunteer people go in there, but he, and he loved theater, but he was just one of those great kids. And then he came to his senior year, and he said, uh, I'd love to go to college, but he said, we don't have any money. And I said, well, let me see what I'm going to do. So we created this thing called the Wellness Wellspring Scholarship, and uh, some folks that said those kids need to go to school. And so we... Um, Helped him go to North Texas. He had to do the Pell Grants and all the other things that you would do to get some money. Went off to North Texas and got his degree in sociology and fine arts and took him four years and um, kept up with him during that time. And then he called me one day and said, hey, I love theater. Is there any way you could help me go get my master's of fine arts? And I said, well, not really. If we've got, don't have a lot of money, but these kids that want to go to school, we just do undergraduate community college or undergraduate. And um, so... Uh, it was a few more weeks later. He says, I said, why don't you do this? He says, I will hire you to be our first theater director. Mm -hmm. So he came back to Waco, became the first director of the Jubilee Theater, and he was incredible. I mean, the talent that child had. Oh, I've been uh, to some of those productions. uh, Wonderful, yeah. And we did a Broadway play. We did Fences. We Mm -hmm. did uh, plays that he'd written. And So three years of that, place packed out, and then one day he said, uh, you not, may not like this, but he said, I just got my dream. He said, the best drama school in the nation in New York City uh, has uh, had 1,200 people apply for three scholarships, and I got one of those three. He said, oh, how fun is that? And uh, so he went to New York City, got his Master's of Fine Arts, and is now directing plays off Broadway and has done some well-known, as an African-American, a lot of the uh, folks that he knew were actors and actresses that are you would know the names of Mm -hmm. and so uh, that kind of stuff is you you know you don't need a whole lot of those great stories but it's like we get to look back and think here's a neighborhood kid that nobody would have thought could be anybody now uh, doing this incredible work on on broadway but we're you know all those kids are important i don't care they pass or not and we found out the uh, just a ton of talent and people that we believe in and the relationship. So I've had great staff through the year. And again, the, the deal was we had the same staff that stuck around over years, knew their mamas, knew their stories. And uh, you just can't, the, the best social worker or program director in, in the world is not going to do you any good unless they stick around for a while. Yeah. And that's what we found was such a valuable part of the, the poverty uh, um, remediation. Mm. Well, I want to pull out to kind of a, a, a Waco angle again and, and, Jimmy, I know you you teach this. You travel around, teach it. You teach a graduate class on it. But 
one one of the things that's that you could help us with, maybe even from a historical standpoint, is this rate of poverty that Waco has, yeah. and, and just. I guess I'll begin with why. You, you know, what what are the factors yeah. in in your experience yeah. and, and in your research that have led to that? Waco has a deep, ugly history of, I guess most cities do, but because of uh, it's an old city with generational poverty that uh, has been here a long time. But when you go back into the history and see the Jesse Washington things, the uh, the tornado that tore downtown in part, uh, mm-hmm. the uh, huge numbers of negative things happened as well. Uh, and and so I couldn't give you the details. Uh, there used to be rumors that the money was controlled and nobody wanted mm-hmm. the, you know, to the, make it popular for people to come back here because they can control the money. I'm not sure if I understand that's true or not. But, but the poverty was there for years. And then uh, as as it moved closer into town, people felt it. And so with a racist background that many of us came from, uh, the poor were blamed for a lot of things that weren't really their fault or or either that or they just uh, were victims to some of the systemic issues that we had created. And uh, and so it was really, um, I think, um, uh, it felt so empty, and the poverty scale never moved. I mean, mm-hmm. year after year, you think something's got to yeah. change, and it didn't. And, you know, even Mission Waco, I thought, well, if y'all are doing all this great work, why does it go down? Well, of course, we were dealing with a fraction of the population, but the reality was there was no larger thing going on to help alleviate poverty. Education was in terrible shape. Uh, the, the uh, uh I guess, the redistribution of wealth was not happening. Mm-hmm. And so... It was, I think, and some of the African American leaders, just great leaders, you know, and, mm-hmm. and they they had to push hard. And, and you go back and you think, those are my heroes. They probably made a lot of people mad because, but they stood up for what was right when it wasn't popular. And I'm on the coattails of those guys way mm-hmm. before me doing stuff that I couldn't have even done. And so I guess the the answer is it just um, it, it was deep. It was deep poverty. And lack of living wages, in my mind, was one of the biggest problems because yeah. when you make seven twenty-five an hour, you multiply that times two thousand eighty hours, which is what a, a full work year is, uh, you end up with fifteen thousand six hundred dollars. Poverty for a family of four today is, is uh, twenty-eight thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. You you can't you're still nine thousand dollars below poverty working full time. So people say well, those people need to get a job. They've got jobs. Mm-hmm. They've got three jobs. There is no insurance. There is no net below them. And and then uh, and honestly, uh, when you look back as from the federal issues, uh, the, the old uh, AFDC uh, Aid for Families and Dependent Children system, the social the the welfare system in their old days was not designed for what it became. It, yeah. it grew beyond. And so a lot of the welfare background almost encouraged uh, mamas not to marry. And if you had a second child, then you got more money. But then the men became oftentimes the predatory. They didn't want to marry them, but they still needed to support them. So you had systems that were ugly and broke, unbroken train of messes that they left. And again, I can't, I'm not blaming anybody, but uh, some people took advantage. The government didn't do a good job of what they did. So in, I think it was 96, 1996, that the Welfare Reform Act was overhauled with TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. And at that point, uh, they cleaned up a lot of the, the, they would tell, you know, these women and men that had to go get jobs. But no, they didn't have enough social workers to ever make it happen. Mm-hmm. With TANF, that changed. And now they had social workers. And what people don't realize, the old stereotypes are that most poor people are black and most poor people uh, aren't working. It's Those things are not true anymore. In fact, yeah. the largest number of uh, recipients uh, are whites uh, and a larger number of blacks, I think, are by percentage. But uh, the, the problem was that there was no uh, jobs. And then and now with TANF, they created jobs so they get started and they had to work or they lose so the average person is on welfare maybe eight or nine months not a lifetime like in the old myth so it was a broken system that got a little better and i'm thinking government systems will never be right they're always Mm -hmm. it's just too big and bulky but but uh, people that don't understand how much has changed for the good 
and how many people have gone to work and how uh, employed. But if you're a mama on the, the poor side of town and you need to get your job across town, the bus system won't get you there. It's t- it takes two hours to, to go around. Now, there's, uh, to the credit of Waco, they're still working on those issues. Yeah. And, uh, but the broken systems were everywhere. And then you had um, incarcerated men coming out because they didn't pay child support. The, the, the brokenness hit from every area. Yeah. And so I think we're still going to experience a certain amount of higher poverty in Waco for years. Uh, there are good things happening now mm-hmm. that are offering $15 an hour jobs at Amazon. But to get there is impossible still almost. Or it takes a lot of extra work. So, again, not blaming, just saying if, if until you get in the middle of it, till you feel that, uh, this weekend we do in what Mission Waco called the poverty simulation. Until you, are, you, you have all the answers you think until you become poor for one weekend, one long weekend, mm-hmm. and realize, uh, man, I, I never, I, I feel it now. And it's not a, we, we've cognitively talked through things as well as experientially do things, but uh, we've had 25,000 people go through that weekend that just, they come out differently because they, f- I mean, I can give a lecture on poverty, yeah. but it doesn't affect the way we think. But when you, for the first time, have a little bit of hunger or realize what they wanted me to do, I can't do because the systems are broken, you begin to understand the bigger issues. Mm-hmm. Well, you, and you're also a pastor. And I say that to say, I mean, part of your career has also been trying to bring this side over to to engage uh, in that work. Yeah. And so I, I'd, I'd love to know, that part of the story too, just, yeah. you, you know, uh, maybe kind of how that evolved. And if there were some moments where, <laughs> you, you know, okay, maybe they're getting it yeah. or, you know, yeah. breakthrough yeah. moments. Yeah. So our priority was always to be legitimate, to be authentically and care for the poor. And so relationships with them has been our, our driving force. My kids grew up, their best friends were African-American and Hispanic and, uh, there was a sense that that's who we became, but the having a background in education and knowing people who knew people, then we could, when there was a project to be done, we had some support for that financially and especially people who loved us and prayed for us. But there was um, a sense where uh, we, everything that happened was sort of like the programs happened at Mission Waco with the church. Like uh, Janet and I saw these bunch of guys under the bridge, I-35, sleeping there and thought, why are they there? And we understood, we knew homeless people hung out, but we went across the street and said, uh, hey, we're eating breakfast over at Taco Cabana. I'll, I'll buy you breakfast if you'll come over and tell us about your life. Why are you on the streets? Explain why you can't get a job. Four or five of them came that morning. We met there for two hours after breakfast. It was fascinating. I learned so much about homelessness. Then uh, he said, let's do it next week. Of course, I bought breakfast. That wasn't a real hard deal. And <laughs> they brought a few more friends, and we sat outside again and had another long conversation. Third week, breakfast cost about $250, and <laughs> oh, we can't keep doing this. We don't <laughs> have that kind of money. But, um, but they said, well, why don't you come under our bridge across the street here where we sleep and, uh, and do a Bible study? And Janet sings and plays the guitar, and so we went over the next week and had five or six chairs, and a few of them sat down, and we did a little Bible study. The noise was horrible because of the 18-wheelers above us. And, but uh, it was, it was kind of fun. They said, let's do it again next week. And so we came back. And, and then the third week, and each time there would be a few more people who would come. And uh, over the months, um, it got larger, and a Baylor kid walked across the street, and a community ter- person or two came in. And, and so it began to have a little bit different look. And we couldn't hear each other, so we bought a – a car battery and a, a Radio Shack microphone that we did alligator clips on to, so we could um, hear each other a little better. And then we realized that, I mean, we had no rules because if it's going to be a church, we we weren't denominational. There was certainly nothing that was um, strategic about how we could do things. And we realized church models don't fit our people. We mm-hmm. And we did some reading, some research around uh, a book called... Uh, Main li- mainstream Christians and Hard Living People. It was a very seminary professor sent out his students to study uh, how, how the poor oftentimes look at clergy, and uh, it was a terrible answer. I mean, the most majority of the poor saw the, the clergy as, as just didn't care. They're making money. They're just, mm-hmm. you know, whatever it is. And then the um, 
uh, at the same time, what's your view of God? Very high view of God, high mm-hmm. sovereignty of God. And what about music? And so they realized that, you know, it wasn't black church music that you were interested in. They, they like country music because they told the real stories of divorce and drinking in the bars and all the stuff. That the, <laughs> and so you, we'd learn things. And so we had a guy wrote a song that was, remember that song, uh, uh, I Love This Bar, mm-hmm. uh, Toby Keith. And, and we had one of the guys rewrite it. He was in jail when he heard it, and he, he rewrote it to I Love This Church. And so that country flair to us. And then we realized over time that, you know, we divide over such silly issues in churches. Yeah. And we would say, you know, we're just going to figure out ways to get along. And so we changed the music style week to week. It didn't have to be the same as the week before. But the poor were always involved in the worship. That mm. was the key. So if you work the streets as a prostitute, it's still okay for you to read the Bible. Uh, if you were the uh, wanted to pray, uh, no matter what your background, you could pray. And so we... We just had this messy uh, services that <laughs> most people would have just scratched their head at and thought, is that really church? Now, I will say this. Uh, it was not an outreach thing. A lot mm-hmm. of people think well, we're a church. We're going to go down and get those people saved. We're going to give them a bunch of stuff and, and, uh, and, and give them the gospel. What they didn't really realize is that they've heard empty words. They've been given stuff on corners. They've had uh, – but – they needed authenticity to the poor yeah. as well as uh, the middle class that came with us. And so it became different. How do you continue to love people who, you know, maybe in and out of county jail? Or how, what do you do with somebody has got schizophrenia that's coming? Nobody teaches you that in the seminary. And so we had to learn a whole lot. But when it all came down to it, it was just friendship. And mm-hmm. so uh, over the years, Church of the Bridge emerged and we – We'll celebrate our 30-year anniversary in about uh, three weeks from now. and, and uh, Under your new sanctuary? Well, no, we'll be back in November there. Okay. So we, got, we moved over after 28 years, and they came in to do the re, restart the whole bridge problems of Interstate 35 that had to be redone. We moved over to the silos. Chip and Joe called and said, hey, we're, we know you guys. We trust you. Uh, come over here, and, and uh, y'all can meet in the courtyard on Sundays. And so we've done that now for two and a half years. But I got a call actually yesterday that said it looks like November is going to be the time that uh, we can go back. Uh, we don't have an exact date yet, but uh, well, our anniversary will be at the silos, but it'll be just maybe two uh, months at the most until we're back under the bridge. But uh, we've done weddings. We've done lots of funerals. We have fun worship. Um, there's creativity. Uh, I've learned a long time ago they'd much rather have a skit about the prodigal son than listen to my boring sermon about the prodigal son. So you, you, the forms of how do you communicate, what is, what's the takeaway, how, what I want them to know at the end of the day, and how can we better communicate that than just the traditional style. We take up an offerings and give it a, give it all away. We mm-hmm. everybody t- put in a dollar and then we'd pass it back around and they'd take out what they needed. And over time there wasn't enough, <laughs> enough money, so we had to make a difference in how we use our money. But today, I mean, when you don't have to pay for your building, when it's a church yeah. uh, that has uh, a, a sanctuary that's made out of stone above us, and we don't take salaries, th- there's money left over to give away. And so we were very mission-minded, not just with uh, local people. We did that a lot. But we support children in Haiti. We've got homeless people that supported a child to go to school in Haiti uh, because they they wanted to be a part of something. They don't want just another handout, another can of corn or Mm -hmm. another uh, sleeping bag. They, just like everybody, want dignity. They Mm -hmm. want to be treated like their people. And so uh, we've learned that. And so it's been been really interesting. And the church has been a great way for outsiders to come sit in. And and there's something real that, that they know is there. And. You know, it may not fit their style, but we have some that just because it's a bigger purpose than just getting my needs met at church that have chosen to stay with us all these years. You know, I've thought about your church, and, you know, there's a lot of underpasses in Baylor, but that one's right. (laughs) I mean, underpasses in Waco, but that one's right there. You know, the juxtaposition is is pretty amazing, you know, and, and again, what may have been driving the consideration initially, and of course I think there's some providence in that, was this group that you met. But the fact that those two groups yeah. are are together yeah. on a Sunday morning yes, is, yeah. That yeah. is... That is powerful. And quite honestly, even the early guys that were duly diagnosed, mentally ill and addicted, uh, pretty rough crowd. They had nowhere to go. There was no shelter in Waco. We ended mm-hmm. up, two of our guys went after church one day into a boarded up house and 
and uh, their candle turned over and they burned to death. And so we went and created the My Brother's Keeper's Shelter. But a lot of those folks were right across the street from Baylor purposely because there were people who drive by and Baylor kids had more money than they mm-hmm. did. And so they feel sorry for them and give them money. Uh, which is not the way we do ministry. That's not the way we think is best for anybody. But but we do uh, train them, and part of that education you were talking about is how do we uh, teach community development and help see those guys changed, that not guys and girls, that, that really do want change. So, um, it, it, but you're right, it, but it, was, it, it became uh, not a place for giving stuff away. It was like my presupposition is I learn as much about God from the poor as I do in the seminary. I have mm-hmm. been, Jesus showed us how to give through the widow with, that had the two mites. We, we see the leper that came back with the Samaritan, the half-breed, that fell at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. Um, Zacchaeus, the rich young, I mean, the, compared to the rich young ruler, uh, Antithesis, the rich young ruler had it all, but Jesus sent him away uh, sorrowful because he wouldn't give up what he had, whereas Zacchaeus, the tax collector, is blessed and becomes a Christian. We, we see this reverse mindset in the, the church has become culturally similar. We, success is numbers and buildings, and, and uh, a big part of it is, is you know, how many can we get there. Uh, I have been. I've learned more about God through. We call ourselves trolls, by the way, because mm-hmm. we we live. Trolls live under bridges, and uh, so we decided that would be our our moniker. And and uh, the troll moniker works for us because we they're not pretty, uh, they're not talented in the world's way, but they're just real. And so, you, all of a sudden you're sitting in church and you learn to. Uh, l- get to know the name of somebody who screams out loud because she's mentally ill. <laughs> you know, you don't do that. You don't know what to do with that in, in real church, kind of whatever that looks like. And so it's, it's, it is a, um, it, it's, a, I think what's fun about church for us is it is a little uneasy for middle class people mm-hmm. to come. And once they get there, there's a sense of, I need to learn more about this. And it takes, takes a while. And so we're not down there to fix everybody. We're not down there to give everything sure. away. We're there to so just say, I'm going to love you no matter what you do. Mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang in here with you, and we're going to get you, uh, help you find a job together. And so the church becomes uh, a center of hope that uh, we've really experienced. The uh, If we think about the, not church under the bridge, but the you know church with a big C, um, you talked about early on in your own life, in your own walk, having trouble with this divide that existed, you know, uh, between ethnicity, between classes, and of course, classes is the harder one to talk yeah, about. It is uh, than, than the ethnic divide. I mean, what do you? And this is stepping outside history, but but I mean, what is the way in which that that divide is is breached? I mean, what what is the way in which? I mean, I mean, I know you've seen it happen some in your career. So how does it happen? Well, one of the joys for me is working with students, uh, not just Baylor students. We have a whole lot of people that come from the outside to come to Waco to do the poverty simulation, and we build relationships with them as well. But uh, I think there are seven or eight different churches around the state that call themselves churches under bridges. The model is not always the same as ours. But usually uh, truth seekers, if I can use that word, Mm -hmm. uh, people who want more in life than just getting the check off the box I went to church mm-hmm. there's just people who I think the, the postmodern kids the kids that have walked away from the church want authenticity yeah. uh, American Christianity is in trouble uh, Western co- Christianity is in trouble each week according, according to Dr. David Barrett 53,000 people in Western Christianity walk away and never come back uh, that we don't feel that as much in Waco because we have a more religious crowd here but uh, there are buildings and you know closed up and people walking away and usually when you talk to that generation that walked away, it's because they, we say racial reconciliation, but we're still with a sprinkling of blacks or browns or whites in there. But it's not really reconciliation. They, and, and we say that we care for the poor, but our budgets don't respect the, that statement that we made based, based on the way we give. And so there's, this, um, there's a certain group of people that I think all of us at some level, when we get honest, we want to get there. We want that deep sense of what I got one life to live. I want it to matter. 
And so I think uh, we call them the pioneers. There, there's usually four types of people in a church. You've got the pioneer who sits and listens to the same uh, parable week after week and says, I'm sick of listening to the stories in Sunday school. We're going to go do something about it. And mm-hmm. they, they branch out. And then there's the early adopters, those that say, you know what, after listening to that and six months later, I'm going to go help him and I'll keep my connection over to the church, but I'm tired of just talking. And then there's that other group that's probably two or three years later, the late adopters that say, you know, um, I'm a, there, there's something's happening over there. I've watched them for years now. And then there's that group that we call the resistors. It doesn't matter what you do, and it may be a bigger group. Yeah. So, so we we discover that it's those pioneers, those Baylor kids, those uh, adults that are disenfranchised from the real church today. They're saying there's got to be more. God cares about the church. He, the church was his primary way of being the body of Christ in the world. There's got to we can't give up hope. And so they, they look around. And again, we're, we're messy. We don't have it all together. So we just, but we're just, I think, asking the right questions and, and not avoiding the hard stuff. So I think it is those, those people who are um, looking for more. Mm-hmm. And I, I think you also said at the beginning, relationship. I mean, that, that's, yep. that's what made, yep. the, I mean, once someone knows the poor, or know someone different that you can't stereotype. Yeah. You can't stereotype yeah. anymore. Had a lady a few weeks ago, uh, African American woman that was uh, dressed p- very poorly, and and she was walking toward the front. And I thought she's probably going to ask me for something. And uh, my traditional white middle class background, she came up to me. She handed me twenty dollars and said, "Hey, uh, there's some people that need this. Give it to them." And uh, she was poor, <laughs> no question yeah. about. It. But you you can't. There's nothing that. Is like that. It's just it's you begin to see the kingdom in ways that you never saw it when you see poor people care, relate, um, pray for uh, in ways that I never did. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to end by just uh, your your mind is always working on what <laughs> what else is needed. I mean, I talked to you fifteen years ago, and you're saying we need a place that can get them from seven dollars an hour to seventeen dollars an hour to eighteen dollars an hour. So I mean, as you kind of think about what you what your community needs or what you hear from the community that they need. Uh, What are some things that that really? Well, it's a fun question to answer now because so many things are in place in Waco that weren't back then, Mm -hmm. that there there is more money because of um, the money coming into town, hotels going up everywhere. The issue that the the negative of what you asked me, I'll tell you that first, is gentrification. Uh, We never saw that coming. Uh, Waco was so poor that uh, I had a friend of mine in Atlanta one time say, buy all the property you can get now, and, and this was 20 years ago, and we didn't do that, and now we wish we had. Mm. And so you end up with the hotels like the Uptown and the, uh, the three or four t- hotels downtown that now have been torn down to build million-dollar buildings because gentrification's there. So uh, I, I, I don't think we'd stop it. It's kind of one of those forces that happens in any city when there's success financially. But um, our people are in bigger trouble now in some ways because housing is out of control. Mm-hmm. And uh, they can't – they're putting three and four families together. So there's some issues that have gotten worse. The other side of it is there are some jobs now that are paying living wages. Um, there are some – uh, there's a heart. The city Waco Council, the city council and the mayor are friends. I, I've, the good news of being in the same town a long time, I, I, I know they care. Uh, and they struggle with heart issues. And so uh, we're, we're looking at how do we, um, we've gone down to Austin several times and looked at a, a village called the Community First Village that is for homeless people that uh, is, is, they've done in great job it's a it's a large project now that's just got about to be double because they've got more income that would provide housing for homeless or formerly homeless or very low income folks so it's that kind of stuff that that i'm looking at now because um i've got a group of of friends that uh, i play tennis with and hang out with that all are retiring and say you know what i'm gonna do the rest of my life i want to make a difference and so it's that circle that we are um Working with city council, we nothing's happening yet, but there's activity, and it it seems to be 
uh, the right time because there's in the old days it was we just got to fix a road because it's we, and now there's money that can be used for some things so we're fighting hard yeah. uh, most of you know the name uh, NIMBY mm -hmm. not in my backyard and it's still here I mean mm -hmm. we'll have a city council meeting somewhere out there and it doesn't matter how good our intentions are there will be those who will come out against that because it makes their property value maybe look a little less or so it, it, the, the corporate thinking is still we're still caring about ourselves more than we care about the community. Yeah. But I do think that there is a corporate um, leadership here that is healthier than it's ever been, and there's more funding. So uh, housing would certainly be the number one issue right now for us, and uh, I'm not sure uh, after that what it'll be, but uh, I'm, I'm going to be involved in that one for a while. Yeah, well, I appreciate you fighting for it. I don't think anybody in the last 50 years is uh, not quite 50 years, but. Well, 50 years, because you've been around for 50 years. This is my 50th better out. anniversary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. I'm, it's, it has been 50. So uh, has uh, you and Janet, I mean, just the contribu contributions y'all have made here locally are amazing. So, And I, I want to thank you for coming on. And, and, you know, history, once you get to a certain age, is just reminiscent. <laughs> it's <so>. exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, you, you asked me to tell you what I'd love to tell you anyway, so thank you. And, and I appreciate not only you, but the, the churches where you go and others go that are Waco's a different town today than it was it's mm -hmm. it's it's healthier in some ways that it wasn't healthy before there's a spiritual uh I think centering in for Bader kids and for some churches that is probably outside of mainstream but it's really healthy and, and fun so see, it'll be fun to see where we go well the Dorals get a part of that yeah. so yeah Cross thank you Thanks for listening to the Waco History Podcast. Like what you heard? Subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes so we can reach more listeners. You can find show notes and info on every episode at wacohistorypodcast.com and more info on Waco's past at wacohistory.org. Our theme music, used with permission, is Cross the Brazos at Waco, performed by the late Billy Walker. For more info on Billy's music, go to billywalker.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast. <laughs>